This is a unique phenomenon in human history. C'est une crise, comme vous l'avez dit, d'un genre très particulier, parce que c'est la première fois dans l'histoire humaine que face à un danger mortel pour un certain nombre de gens, on a décidé d'arrêter l'économie. On est dans, dans l'instant permanent. The 300, die every day c'est aussi, euh, aussi aux citoyens de, de, de dire euh, halt. Euh, je, je suis surpris par l'obéissance par des masses. The importance of forming judgment. The importance of saying, I will wait to see a transcript before I comment. Ces plaintes ont quelque chose de totalement indécent. The coronavirus has had an, an impact on humanity as a whole. Uh, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, why why is it that why is it that there's no language to distinguish these kinds of maximalist positions from from normative liberal progressive? How do I explain to people when they're going off the rails and they say, "No, well, you know, for a long time we things haven't been right, and uh, yeah, they're going to be eggs broken, and some people are going to get their careers destroyed, but we were long past time for a reset, long past time." for a reversion of roles and women have been getting it very bad for a long time. So some men will suffer in this new regime while right. they're right. correcting and overcorrection was called for. So what do you say to these people and what kind of language, again, uh, tell me, explain to me how I can explain to people that this isn't, this isn't liberal and this isn't fair. I, mean, I, th I think one thing, you're, you're right to identify the people who say, well, that, that may be the case, but, you know, an overcorrection is needed. They cannot answer the questions you need to ask of them next, such as, when would you know you overcorrected for long enough? Who would identify that you'd got to that point? And when would you know you'd got mm -hmm. back to equal? Right, these, are, these are very important things. Is there a time limit set on the overcorrection, for instance? And uh, in my sense, uh, they know the answer to these questions. I put two other things out there. The first, by the way, is that I'm sure you know the famous uh, egg breaking uh, story of arguing with Stalinist who agrees that it's true there have been excesses already, it's true that 37 wasn't so great, and so on and so on, and goes on and all pushes and pushes until the Stalinist says what he knew he was going to say along, which is you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs, and Orwell memorably replied, where's your omelette? It, it's one of the questions you have to ask of everyone who's, who's over-eager at egg-breaking. As for where that comes from, th there's um, a late um, uh, conservative liberal uh, political philosopher from Australia, Kenneth Minogue, uh, who died a few years ago, who wrote a book in the 70s called Liberal Imagination, in which he used a metaphor that I've found very useful. And it applies to a lot of the people fighting the rights battles at the moment. And it, it, it's this, he, he, it's what he described as St. Georgian retirement syndrome. That, and it's a useful concept. Um, St. George gets a lot of credit for slaying the dragon. And St. George in this situation may be tempted to find more dragons to slay in order to get that applause again and find himself swinging his sword at smaller and smaller creatures until eventually in retirement, St. George can be found swinging his sword at thin air. Right. Now, I think this is a very important thing to bear in mind because an awful lot of people have spent part of their time in recent years exaggerating, accentuating divides precisely in order to gain some of the acclaim that people have recent generations won winning real battles. That is, they would like to accentuate the problems between the sexes, the question of relations between the sexes, because they would like to be acclaimed, as our societies rightly acclaim, first, second wave feminists for their work. You know, these are people who would love to uh, have been at the Stonewall Inn in uh, 1968. Uh, they'd have loved to have been uh, with Martin Luther King or March in Washington. Uh, you know, who wouldn't? But it means that you have to, you have to 
If your society has improved since then, I think in most of our cases we have on all of these issues, it means you have to you have to present the situation as never having been worse at the right, situation right. when it's never arguably been better. Okay. Uh, but a lot of a lot of people are not exaggerating. A lot of them are just maddened by social media and new technologies, which completely reconstructed our relationship to each other, to society, and and to the media, and and to the way we speak. And it's something you write about in the book. So maybe very quickly, uh, you know, it's it's not just it's not just a lot a lot of people who are who are fakers who want the the glory of, of times past. A lot of it is social media and the structure of these technologies which madden us. Uh, yes, that's right. As you know, I'm not, I spent a certain amount of time in Silicon Valley researching what was happening with some of the tech companies on this. And it is very disturbing how our, uh, our brains are being altered, our behavior is being altered, how uh, confirmation bias is even more rife, rife than it was before, uh, how you have whole, whole media platforms where people just can't understand why votes don't go their way because they thought everybody voted that way. Uh, this, this has a lot to do with the one thing above all, and this is a, an ironic time to be talking about this perhaps, but the the, the, the diminishment of face-to-face uh, exchange um, between people. Uh, it's one of the things that Tocqueville actually mentions in, uh, in Democracy in America, how struck he is by the significance of face-to-face interaction in the political debate. I think there's no doubt now that, that not being face-to-face and indeed not having to show your face, which is even more important in a way, yes. means yes. that you can so demonize distance and derange yourself uh, about the other and about yourself yes. and do so in the in the erroneous belief that you yourself are solely acting in good for the good yeah and you know as we know from um uh much of history and much of political philosophy in, or- in order to do something really bad you you generally have to think you're doing it in the cause of good yeah yeah Let's uh, go, go over the Q&A. I had a question that came in to me, that came in to me right before the interview with a friend. Uh, it's actually the academic and uh, uh, Russian historian, Paul de Kunoy. He's the head of academic press. I don't know if you know Paul. He's a great fellow. He's a, a champion of free speech and free thought. So he, he had a question that he asked me to relate to you. So uh, I'm going to give uh, my, my, my friend Paul the honor of the first question, which is, after the Scranton affair, will media... And government be more cautious about accusations. This is the uh, presumably of reference to Roger Scruton. Yes, Scruton, yes. The uh, that was a very interesting corner that happened there. Yes, the late uh, political philosopher and philosopher Roger Scruton he'd be appointed a few years ago now to a position, an unpaid position by the British government to advise on house building, which is a, is a massive issue in, in all of our countries. Um, and he ha- had this unpaid position. A journalist went to interview him from the New Statesman, and this journalist was clearly going in to do a hatchet job. Uh, said he wanted to interview Roger about a number of his books, which had just been republished. Clearly, hadn't any of the books in question, or indeed any books, as far as I could see. And uh, went in to do an unbelievable hatchet job. He uh, said that Scruton had said things in the interview about the Chinese. Uh, about Muslims, about all sorts of people, said he'd said terrible things. And in actual fact, it turned out when uh, I got hold of the transcript that, that, that this wasn't the case, that the journalists had lied. By the time the journalists had tweeted out, uh, Scruton was within, I think, three hours fired from his position by the Conservative government of Theresa May and was uh, roundly turned on by almost all of the press who denounced him as a racist, misogynistic, homophobe, etc., etc. It was a very ugly episode, and I uh, did what I could to try to make it right, because I knew it wasn't true, because I knew Roger Scruton, and I was honoured to have him as a friend, and I I knew he wasn't the things that people had said or had been guilty at all of the things that this interviewer claimed. But yes, it was a very worrying episode. And it was worrying because in in an era, by the way, of course, which we're all, you know, people talk about things like fake news all the time and don't really dig down into what's going on 
or what they mean by this. But this, this was an example of a, of a journalist lying and being able to effectively scalp um, a philosopher, you know, a, a man of extraordinarily deep and wide thinking, uh, scalp him and get him uh, almost completely unpersoned. Uh, and by a government which might have been seen to have been in many ways sympathetic. I, I know that a number of members of parliament in the UK who jumped on that bandwagon quite swiftly regretted having done so. Yes. And yes. There, is, there is, I think, a lesson in that, which is the, the importance of showing prominent public figures yes. the importance of forming judgments, the importance of saying... I will wait to see a transcript before I comment. And that is, by the way, in journalism as well, where I spend a certain portion of my time, this is a very interesting denigration that's occurred in recent years. At almost any time up until the last few years, if a reporter went with a highly controversial interview that they were planning to go big on claims about, the editor would say, first of all, have you got a tape? If you said yes, the editor would ask to listen to the tape. And if you said no, you'd be in a whole world of trouble and the interview would not be going ahead. So what actually was shown in that was that every, every bit of society that it crossed against demonstrated failure. Journalism yeah. demonstrated a failure. But the politicians who jumped on, I know that a number of them uh, who I've spoken to and some of whom have said this publicly, uh, did in the end regret their hasty judgment. Um, but in order to write that, uh, of course, cannot be um, completely. Roger passed away uh, in January. Um, but uh, in general, I think that this must be righted by people seeing that there is a price to pay for jumping on ill thought through bandwagons, just as they see there being a price, a prize won by jumping on them. Let's giving our, our nice attendees a chance to say something. Let's clump all the coronavirus questions for later. Let's keep going thematically. So, well, Ms. Caroline Bacos wants to know, uh, she says, very interesting debate. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, she says, I was wondering if you could develop a bit more on what it means to be a liberal in the USA versus the United Kingdom. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a, a simple thing, really, I think, which is just that there is a complete terminological difference, which is that um, liberal in the US now means, solely means somebody who's left wing and yeah. uh, adheres to, uh, broadly speaking, the platform of the Democratic Party and the political divide in the US now, and it's, it's happened over recent decades, is liberal versus conservative. The reason I say there's a difference is that in the UK in particular, which I, obviously I, know, I know best, uh, um, it isn't the case that the debate is liberal versus conservative. You could say it's left wing versus conservative, or left wing versus right wing. But there's a significant enough portion of people who still recognise a liberal tradition to exist on the political right, the, the, the one that uh, Vlad mentioned at the beginning is, is feeling a part of. And uh, it's that, it's the fact that in America, the term has just simplified and reduced itself. Whereas, as I say, in the UK, it can be, it, it can cover all manner of virtues or, or their opposite. Yeah, I used to be uh, on the center left of a Democratic Party. And, and, and actually, you, what, one could agree on basic foundational truths mm -hmm. and foundational procedures with people in the center and in the center right, and you know, in some cases, further right. Not not that wings actually mean anything. It's not like we're going to learn to fly if we talk about wings enough. But you know, mm. it does help to deal with taxonomy. But mm. it used to be that people in the center of the center left and the center right agreed on basic foundational mm -hmm. procedures, right? And and now now it seems like there's no commiseration on on, on what procedures we agree on doesn't feel like we have any kind of consensus on 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 what it means to uh, you know respect other people's speech and you know that kind of stuff and, and sad and sadly not even an agreement on on facts and which by the way I mean we have this problem in in, in, in Europe as well I mean you know it's one of the most worrying things of our day is is uh, is the exacerbation of an existing problem which obviously technology is is the primary cause of but the exacerbation of things so that we end up in this position where the truth is whatever you're having yourself. Yeah, we have more Scruton questions, but let's leave that to, to the end. Let's ask um, 
something from Mr. Ferdinand Weisenfeld about China and uh, the crisis. Do you think we should reduce our dependency on, on the Chinese? And, and did we go overboard on that? Uh, I think I think that's that's the one I've written recently that I think that's the one thing about this crisis you can be fairly sure of, which is to be a massive surge in concern about supply chains and much more to do with the Chinese. Um, I, my own view is that everyone is learning fast what anyone who did any business in China in recent decades uh, learned fast, which is the extent to which you can't trust the books. Uh, the fact that the figures you're given may not be the figures. I don't even go into the area of, of intellectual and other theft that's yeah. gone on on a on an unbelievable scale. I mean, I take it for, for granted that our public is all perfectly well developed enough to know the difference between Chinese people and the Chinese Communist Party that runs the country. I think that there is simply going to be a massive upsurge after this of what one might think of just as being a scepticism, where um, where even just a few months, somebody who said I think we should buy. Uh, you know, Chinese products and more on French homegrown products or whatever it is, which our own innovation. They just those people were, were were much weaker in their arguments just a few months ago than they are now, and there's no doubt about it. Even if this were a one event, which I I, I don't think I have any confidence that it will be. Even if it were a one-off event, it'd be one that that at some deep level to go back to the thing we were talking about at the beginning at some deep level we are going to re- we are going to remember and it's going to make it an awful lot easier to argue that we simply need to be far less reliant than we've been on, we've been on China and there will be arguments made by people we have previously supported that will surprise us but I, I simply think that it's an inevitability of this crisis and I, I, I for one don't especially okay okay good answer we have Mr. Weisenfeld asking, what will your opinion be the most important changes in the world after the end of this current crisis? Well, as I say, I'm very reluctant to engage in futurology on it because it's always been a mugs game. Uh, um, I think of all the famous books that written and depraised and what puts as the much more predicting things that just didn't happen. So all, all reading of, of past futurology is is worthwhile in order to remind ourselves of the perils. We operate in, in a fog and we stumble along a path and we find the path as we go along. Now, that's not the interest, the interesting thing. When we look back, however, we see the man, we see the path, we don't see the fog. Um, everything looks like it was going to happen after it's happened. Uh, now, I, I would just add a, a couple of things to that. The, the first is, of course, you simply have the best headlights, the best searchlights you can possibly have on. You have the best minds, the best interpretation you can. And uh, I maybe we'll work a bit harder at that as societies. Okay. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, I just come back to this point, if I may. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I think we should have a considerable scepticism of people who never thought about pandemics or virology and have mugged, mugged awfully fast in recent weeks. Um, because as we all know, the, um, complex issues like that cannot be mastered uh, in a matter of, of days or weeks. And we should be cynical when people use them to uh, um, to predict uh, certain trends. But I think there are certain things that we will obviously uh, individually be taking away from this. I think we will obviously be... be work change that many people foresaw at the turn of the millennium, that is the idea of more people working from home year on year, that, that finally maybe we will have actually arrived at that place. But other than that, as I say, I think that this can go in both or all directions simultaneously. For instance, people are likely to be very concerned about mass gathering public events for quite a long time to come. Um, live concerts, for instance. At the same time, some of us are craving the opportunity to get together for live music performances again. So it'll be all of these things. Yeah, that's a good answer. 
Miss Corinne Levy Laurent wants to know if uh, Europe would be less or more integrated as a result of the pressures arising from COVID-19? That's a very good question. I think the answer is, is, is less. Yeah. If you look at the opinion polls in Italy about anti-EU sentiment in recent uh, uh, weeks, it has soared extraordinarily. I mean, by double digits, high double digits. That is because of something we all know. I mean, I, by the way, I should just say, um, as uh, somebody who's British, obviously, um, I say this without any truck on this. I haven't to have been a supporter of Britain leaving the EU, but I do believe that once you've made your statement by leaving a club, you should wish the club well, and I very, very much do. So I say this without any, um, as it were, negative bias towards the EU. But I do think that a very powerful lesson, or at least fear that it was a lesson, has been imbibed by the Italian public in recent weeks. Yeah. And that is the actions of the French and German governments in doing exactly what they said the EU had set up not to do in the early days of this crisis, and that is to become protectionist. I know that there have been apologies since and more. I think it'll be, it'll be very hard, my, the Italian friends I speak to, it'll be very hard for the EU to win back the trust, and particularly for the French and German governments to win back the trust of the Italian public on this question. It's been bubbling away for a long time, as you all know, from a range of crises, not least the migration crisis that I wrote about in The Strange Death of Europe, there's mm -hmm. been a bubbling yeah. feeling in Italy for a long time that it keeps on getting onto the front line of problems and then is effectively abandoned. And uh, I think that sentiment I hear and see is growing in Italy on this crisis. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, Italy is such a core member of, of the union and a uh, founder member, and, and, and it's this can't be dismissed like, you know, one of the Visegrad countries or something, you know, which uh, I don't like the fact that they're dismissed by a lot of people in Europe. But you, ca you cannot lose Italy like that. It's a it's a it's a founding it's a founding country of 60 million population. And then being told that there will be no euro bonds. It's it's pretty cold. Yeah. 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 Cool. I f and I feel I just feel very sorry for the Italian people for the what what they have gone through in, in, in recent months. But also in recent years, this has been a very, very tough decade. You know, I have a, I have the same question from two people, one of whom happens to be my spouse. Oh. Uh, so uh, my, my wife and uh, Michelle ask variations on, on the same question. My wife phrases it uh, in, a, in a personal way. She says, if you were prime minister of UK, would you impose strict lockdown on Spain or a more liberal approach like Sweden? Mr. Michel uh, has a different uh, variation on the same question, says UK will probably end up with the worst death toll in Europe as the result of a political decision. And should Brexit be put on hold in order to avoid adding more disruption to the economy? I think I know what you're going to say, but please say it, sir. Uh, the last bit, no, I don't think it should be. I, I think it would be very unwise. Um, uh, we, we had a terrible, terrible stress test in democracy in the UK in recent years because, in my view, once you ask the public to vote on something, it is a very sacred contract that you then do what they ask. Because not every democracy has this view, um, but uh, in Britain this is held very, very strongly. And uh, the fear that, that the, what the public voted for, not in a vast majority, but they voted for in a majority in 2016, was not going to happen, was for many of us and simply the worst imaginable time bomb because uh, uh, to tell, you know, there was, as I've said many times, there was no form of Brexit so bad that it was worse than no Brexit at all once the public had voted for it. And I, I stick with that. I think that um, delays will be seen as, um, even in these extraordinary circumstances, will be seen as being... Uh, you know, and it will be used by some people as a way to demonstrate their argument that we should remain. And we just don't have the bandwidth to keep going around a vote now four years ago. Uh, I think uh, that all the polls show that, I mean, the deep desire of the public, as expressed in the box as well, to get this behind us, to get on and to have as good a working relationship and everything else as we can possibly have with the EU and to do that as fast as possible. And I think all delays will be looked on with, with 
deep skepticism by the public. As for the question about COVID, if I may say so, I'd like to duck that. I've traveled a certain amount in, 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 in China, much more in most of the rest of the world, but I'm very wary about, about this for the, for the following reason, which is I, I think that this can only be answered if, if we are able to have the debate on the terms I described earlier, which is to say, um, let's at least start by conceding this is a very, very fine judgment call that governments are having to make at the moment on this. And I just mentioned that because certain uh, people, particularly in the commentariat, one way or the other, and I, I, it just seems obvious to me that the the two particular things that, that are being contested and are rubbing against each other at the moment on this are the virologists and the experts in pandemics and the economists. And uh, if one was to simplify it, I don't know exactly what I would do. I just don't know the answer to that. I know that I, like everyone else, is daily more and more worried about the economic fallout we see from this. And and at the same time, I think that the, the government, broadly speaking, have done the only thing they could have done in the circumstances. I mean, it's a, it's an extraordinarily difficult decision, and, and you know, one way or the other, lots of people are going to die. It depends which decision you make. There are excess deaths from economic collapse, just that there are excess deaths from from uh, not responding uh, to a virus strongly enough. I mean, it's an extraordinarily difficult decision. And by the way, I mean, one thing is that we should be very, very careful about um, is that there will be a growth in the argument that because the, the worst death toll rates weren't necessarily achieved, which hopefully looks like at the moment, touch wood, is the case, there will be people who say, ah, oh, you see, the whole thing was an overreaction. And that if we hadn't have done this, we wouldn't, if we hadn't have done this, we would have been at the same stage. And, and I think that's, that's an argument which will have to be pushed back on in due course. Uh, well, I mean, let's get out of the epidemic before we, we start going in that direction. There's one more question. It's an irreverent one, so it's a good way to end the evening. In your discussion with Roger last year, you jo- jokingly suggested forming a Scruton Murray College. Do you think there's in reality a need for it? educational uh, establishments which diverge from quote-unquote left-wing orthodoxy? Uh, I do, but I think we have to be precise about what's gone wrong in the academy. I mean, yes, it was a slightly joking reference at the event I did with Roger Scruton in London after um, his vindication last um, he, he jokingly raised it as the Scruton Murray Academy and, uh, you know, uh, some bewildered young students <laughs> would turn up for for um, 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 educational improvement, it, it would be a lovely idea. I think that it is the case that something, a set of things have gone badly wrong in the academy, uh, and w- we all know it uh, in different areas. Uh, my experience, people tend to think it's their own area that's wor- their own area of expertise that's worse, and and are somewhat horrified to discover the same problems exist across the disciplines. I think that the specific one is, or at least the most worrying one actually, is when areas effectively fizzle down, What I mean, when they sort of run out. Uh, Ross Dothat has written a book on an aspect of this, and um, I, I'm glad that he was starting to pick it up, which is different from ideological conformity and demand for conformity, which undoubtedly exists. In, in many, many parts of the uh, um, university system in the West. I think that the, the, the one that, that comes from that as well is where areas effectively start to run out of um, stuff to do. And uh, I think this is a, a significant problem for the humanities. I think very many people have noted it in that. And we're then generally, those of us who are humanities graduates, are horrified when we discover that the hard sciences and other things we were hoping to rely on, where at least the work was still being done, are encountering at least some of the same problems. Right. It's been described as the great innovation. This does worry me immensely. My own view is that it's because, certainly in the areas I know about, and I'm not an expert in the hard sciences, yeah. but areas I know about, yeah. they tend to have the same problem. It's not just the politicization, it's the cul de sacization of the particular so-called. And that's where a lot of the things I, I identify in the madness of crowds have gone wrong. These are areas 
which should have stopped. Uh, they had come to the end of what was u- useful to explore, and yet they continue. And I would just say that 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 that, that it is the university system most of all which is uh, which demonstrates her science law, which is things that cannot go on won't, is not true necessarily in the university system where things that cannot go on very often do. Okay, well, on that depressing note, thank you so much. This has been this has been a pleasure. It's been an education as I expected it to be. Thank you, Sophie, for having us, for organizing this, for being so generous. Uh, sir, uh, next time I see you, drink sir on me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Both you, of you. Thank you, Vlad. It was really a thought-provoking um, webinar. Thank you uh, to you, Douglas, and thank you to, to Vladislav. Thank you very much.